All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the uh, third lecture, then. This will be for Thursday, um, I think, the 28th of May. It's kind of hard to keep track of dates these days, but uh, here we go. So a um, couple things we left off. We were talking sort of about the, the path of the... Uh, the sun in the, uh, in, uh, what am I trying to think of? We're talking about the, the path of the sun on the celestial sphere and the idea then that the sun um, follows this, this path called the ecliptic, which is really just a reflection of the plane on the er of the Earth's orbit then on the celestial sphere. And this idea, though, that the equator and the celestial sphere, the celestial equator, the Earth's equator, basically the plane of our, our rotation doesn't line up then with the plane of our orbit, because the Earth is tilted a little bit over on its side. We're tilted then by that, that 23 and a half degrees um, as we go around the sun. So we're always tilted like that. And that that has consequences then in terms of where the sun is going to appear on the celestial sphere at different times of the year. And it's also then going to sort of affect then how, um, how do you want to say this, how the, how the sun is appearing uh, relative to the, the celestial equator, and how the sun's appearing in our sky. Maybe I'm just going to say it that way. Or this idea, if you think about it then, um, when you're looking sort of at what we're going to call the northern summer, um, here's our, you know, we're not straight up and down. Oh, dang, nabbit, we're not straight up and down like that. We're tilted a little bit towards the sun, 23 and a half degrees towards the sun. So when we talk about summer in the north, then the northern hemisphere then of the earth is sort of tilted towards the sun. And in the northern winter, then, six months later, as we go around the orbit, remember the direction of our spin axis over the course of the year doesn't change. Yeah, there's a 26,000 year wobble, but over the course of a year, you're not going to notice that. So effectively, over the course of the year, the, the direction of the rotation axis doesn't change. And so six months later, we're over here on the opposite side of the sun, and now the northern hemisphere then is tilted away from the sun. And yes, this idea that that is what's going on um, with the seasons. And you can sort of see it even here. I'm telegraphing what we're going to talk about a little bit later, though. This idea that in the northern winter, when we're tilted away from the sun, oh, look, the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. It's their summer. Six months later, the southern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. It's their winter, which corresponds then um, to our summer. And there are a couple of different reasons then um, why this affects sort of the temperatures um, on the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, how we're tilted. And one way to think about it, or one thing that's going on then, is remember, you know, that if you're looking towards the south, um, you've got the North Celestial Pole behind you, and the height of the North Celestial Pole is equal to your latitude. Well, 90 degrees away, if you're looking towards the south, the height of the celestial equator in the south is going to be 90 degrees minus your latitude. And so that celestial equator in the south is fixed, but there are times when the sun is above the celestial equator in the north during the summer months. There are times when the sun is below the celestial equator then in the winter months, which means in the summer the sun gets higher in the sky um, over the course of the day, and it takes a lower path then um, during the winter. And this affects then um, how much sunlight we're getting and also then the angle that the sunlight's going to come in. And let me sort of just show you real quick. Um, I'm going to see if we can get Stellarium going here. All right, so got Stellarium filed up, fired up here then. I've got it set then for March 21st. It's uh, uh, pretty close to, to noon here. Actually, let me back this off a little bit. There we go. There we go. Okay, so I've got Stellarium set here for sort of the view from Boone. Um, I've set it then for uh, March 21st, and it's a little bit afternoon. We're on daylight saving now, time now, so technically it's like uh, 1.30 in the, the afternoon. But I've turned on here sort of the altitude azimuth grid then, and you can see we're looking towards the south, 180 degrees, and the height of the sun then, the altitude of the sun, is at about 55 degrees. Um, um, here in Boone. And this, here we go. So this is March 21st, and this is the vernal equinox. This is when the sun is on the celestial equator. And so real quick here, let me pop up the, uh, the equatorial coordinate system then, or the coordinate right ascension and declination on the celestial sphere. And here we see then zero degrees declination. This is the celestial equator, and boom, there's the sun right there 
on the celestial equator. And let me turn off the azimuthal grid and show you then the ecliptic grid. This is the ecliptic right here. This is the path of the sun um, as it on the celestial sphere over the course of the year. And you can see right here then the, uh, the ecliptic, the path of the sun, intersecting then the celestial equator. And boom, right there, that's where the sun is then um, on March 21st. All right, so let's go back then and show you the altitude. Okay, fine. So here it is, noon, March 21st, vernal equinox, first day of spring. Woo! Okay, well, let's move forward. Here's April 21st. At the same time, sort of noon looking up. Now the sun is a lot higher in the sky. May 21st, even higher. June 21st, first day of summer then. This is the summer solstice. This is as high as the sun's going to get in the sky then at noon. And we can even turn back on the ecliptic grid. And there's the ecliptic right here then, zero degrees. This is the path of the sun. And look at how high then the sun is on the ecliptic then, um, and how high then it appears um, in our sky on that day. And so, so looking at this then, it's at an altitude then of almost a little bit more than 75 degrees up in the, the southern sky then at noon. Because again, you've got the celestial equator, right uh, there it is the celestial equator right here in our sky this is fixed the celestial equator then is always appearing here in our sky but the sun 23 and a half degrees above the celestial equator then on the summer solstice and so um let me get that off there we can go on so now here's july august now here's september 21st then um and thinking about then, oh, it's back um, on the celestial equator. Let's put that up again. So here's the celestial equator. The sun, as it moves on the celestial sphere then, is now it's gone a little bit south. It's traveled down to the celestial equator. And the sun then is reappearing in our sky then at the same sort of about, uh, there we go, at about 55 degrees or so, the same altitude it was during the vernal equinox, except now it's on its way down. This is the autumnal equinox. And we can keep going then through October. October, November. Oh, no, we switched off daylight saving time, so let me uh, adjust for that. There we go. Uh, uh, November, and then finally December. And now this is as high as the sun gets in our sky then in December, and the altitude here then is only, looking at this, only about 30 degrees or so. This is as high as the sun gets during the day. You're looking at noon then towards the south here. And we can put back on here um, you know, here's the, the um, um, ecliptic grid, and so this line here then is the path of the sun on the celestial equator, and yeah, it's, uh, it's where it should be, um, but if we look, this is getting confusing with all these lines, um, but where is it? Here is the celestial equator right here, and the sun then 23 and a half degrees then below the celestial equator then on uh, uh, December 21st then on that uh, on that summer solstice and we can keep going then back to uh, um, January February March oh we're back on daylight saving time just a second there, ooh, ooh, too far there we go um so but that's the basic idea then thinking of this then as what's going on um, with our with our seasons then or part of the reason for our our seasons another issue though is if you think about the angle that the sunlight is uh, is striking the ground and so you think about if the sun you know, i got a little sun here let me sort of tune it up a little bit there we go so i've got a sun here and i don't know how well you'll be able to see this then but i've got the sun then almost directly shining down um on this piece of paper like this. And you can see the light is really concentrated and focused. But if I change the angle that the light is shining, I've got the same amount of light, but if, if the angle, um, if it's coming in sort of from the side here like this, or what we might think of as, as sort of a, a glancing angle like this, that light is spread out over a lot more area. So coming straight down, it's concentrated. As that angle increases, as, the, as, as it sort of yeah, it gets it's more and more steep or, or sort of uh, more extreme, more glancing. That light then gets spread out more and more and more. And so when you think about the summer and the sun then being very, very high in the sky, um, that sunlight then is almost coming straight down. And that light then is concentrated in a very small area. So you've got all that light, small area. You've got a lot of heat energy then um, per square meter. Then the sun's doing a lot of warming. And you can, as the sun though gets lower and lower in the sky, that angle then gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And as you start talking about then, you know, sort of, you know, a steeper angle, you're at more glancing angle, you're taking that light and you're spreading it out um, more and more and more. So it's sort of a, a two sorts of things here then, the angle of the sun um, and um, as the, the 
I'll just say it, the, the more glancing that angle is then, um, the more spread out the light is. The, the less energy then you have per square meter, the less heating you have. So that angle then is really, really important. Also though, think about the length of the day. And the time then, well, the celestial sphere then has to carry the sun from the east to the west during its rotation, rising and setting then over the course of the day. Well, in this diagram, here's your celestial equator going from the east to the west and thinking about then, um, okay, go one rotation like this from east to the west, fine, that's one sort of, well, I don't want to say one day, but sunrise to sunset then. If the sun is north of the celestial equator, though, um, well, it's, it's maybe rising here north of east, and it's going around like this to a higher position in the sky at noon, and then it's setting then north of west. It's spending more time above the, above the, uh, above the horizon, as opposed to the winter then, where you, the sun is rising then south of east, and so maybe it's rising here, and it's basically then spending less time above the horizon. You already know this though, that here in the north in the summer, the days are longer, and uh, when you get to the, you know, uh, when you get to the, like here in the summer, the days are longer. Um, when you get to the winter, then the days are shorter and shorter and shorter. And believe me, I'm from Wisconsin, where those winter days are much, 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 much uh, shorter um, than they are down here even. But this also affects more heating, or, or also affects the heating. The longer the sun is above the horizon, the longer it's up in the sky, warming the ground, the more heat you're going to get. And so this sort of all makes sense then. If you talk about the winter, the sun is lower in the sky um, in the northern hemisphere. The light as it's striking the ground is more spread out, so you get le less heating then per square uh, meter, and the sun spends less time then um, above the horizon. Less, uh, the days are shorter then um, in the winter in the north. And that's reversed then in the summer where you get more heating then and more direct, direct rays. And this also then... Um, is, you know, it's basically then caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis then. And this also explains then simultaneously what's happening in the winter. Um, sorry, what's happening then in the winter in the southern hemisphere when we've got summer in the northern hemisphere. And that's what this picture is sort of trying to show then. The sun is off in this direction here. We've got a whole bunch of sunlight then shining like this. And if you think about what's going on, this is the equator of the Earth. Here's our 23 and a half degree tilt then. The northern hemisphere then is tilted towards the sun. The southern hemisphere is away from the sun. And if you just look at it then, um, the, the northern hemisphere, sort of just follow the line through the pole here like this, the northern hemisphere has got a lot more light shining on it then than the southern hemisphere does. So the northern hemisphere has all of this light shining on it. The southern hemisphere then only has this much light shining on it. So we've got this situation where we've got the northern summer and the southern winter going on. And, you know, six months later, now we're on the other side of the sun. So the sunlight then in, here in the in the northern summer, the sunlight's coming in from the, the right then, going to the left where we are. Six months later, we've gone from here in our orbit. Now we're over on the other side. And now the sunlight is coming in from the left to the right, shining on the Earth like this. Again, our axis, the direction of our axis then hasn't changed. It's still pointing towards Polaris as we go around. But here in the northern hemisphere then, here's the equator, we've only sort of got this much light shining on us. And in the southern hemisphere, they've got that much light shining on it. And so here we've got our northern winter then corresponds to the southern summer. And so this is how we can get then this flipping, this reversal of the seasons between the hemispheres. Um, and so, a uh, quick question for you then. What would happen if the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis was a lot less? Instead of uh, uh, 23 and a half degrees, maybe only 5 degrees. And think about then the differences then that we'd see um, in the seasons if our axis was, was tilted less. And so I'll give you a second to think about that and to pick an answer. Okay, and right away, um, when you're taking multiple choice tests, if the answer doesn't jump right out at you, there are a whole bunch of strategies. And one strategy then is, of course, to eliminate the answers that are just like, no. Um, so a fifth season, what? No. All right, so you can totally rule out um, D. And we know the seasons are the result of the tilt in our axis. And so we would still, even at five degrees, have a tilted axis. So um, it, the seasons wouldn't go away. Um, so it's probably not A because our axis is still tilted. And so your choice then boils down to would the seasons be more extreme or less extreme if our axis was tilted um, a lot less than 23 and a half degrees. And of course, because 
a lot of this, you know, the seasons are due then to how long the sun is in the sky and the angle the light is coming in. Um, if the, the, the tilt was less, there wouldn't be that much of a difference then um, in the angles that the sun is appearing in the sky. There wouldn't be that much of a difference then in the difference between, you know, how long the day is uh, in the summer versus the winter. Um, everything would just be less extreme with less ex with less extreme tilts. And so the answer to this would be um, B. And it, it's fun to, to think about, well, what would things be like if you lived on a planet where the tilt was like 90 degrees and we'll talk about that then, because we do have a planet in our solar system um, that's tilted like that. Um, another sort of question then, well, okay, 13,000 years from now, how will the seasons be different? And this is a, this is a little trickier problem then. So um, I'm going to go back to my coffee cup sun, and I'll just use my flashlight as the Earth then. So here we are right now, and we would look at this, and assuming then... Um, north is up then we would look at this and we'd say okay well this is northern winter because the north pole then is pointing away from the sun and the 13,000 years so is sort of magic though because remember there's that 26,000 year wobble then in the earth's rotation axis so you know over time we're sitting here wobbling on our axis like this 13,000 years from now we'll have gone through half a wobble and so 13,000 years from now, um, when the Earth is in the spot it is now for, say, winter in the north, 13,000 years from now, we'll have gone through half a wobble then, and now the northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun. And, um, oh goodness, then, that means then that'll actually be um, uh, summer. Or the seasons will be reversed then, with the northern summer uh, happening in December and the northern winter um, happening in June. And, okay, I should just... For those of you who are really worried about this, um, I'm just going to point out that our calendar actually um, does is built then to actually adjust for this, which is a really weird thing to think about. But anyways, um, so there you go. Um, all right. So I uh, just want to okay. I just want to go back and reinforce this one thing. Um, this idea of you know the the. It's summer and winter because our distance from the sun changes. It does, but um, we've already talked about that then. Um, we're closest to the sun, um, actually um, not in what we would, not our, uh, uh, what are we going to say? Not, there, let me just, there we go. Um, Okay, we're closest to the sun then actually in December. And so if you're thinking about, well, the, the winter then is due to us being far from the sun, the summer is us, us being close to the sun. No, December is not necessarily a warm month. month. June is not necessarily a cold month here in the north. So no, that doesn't really fit. And it also then doesn't really explain then um, how the northern and southern hemispheres would be different. The whole earth would be warmer when it was closer to the sun, not just the northern hemisphere or not. Not just the southern hemisphere. And I should mention again, just getting ahead, Mars also has an elliptical orbit, but it's a lot more elliptical than the Earth's orbit is. And the distance to the sun actually does play a role in the seasons of Mars. But we're not on Mars. So um, the seasons then are due to the tilt of the Earth. Another thing though that, that happens is if you think about where you see the sun in the sky, I mean, you can go back to... Um, Back to Stellarium here, and I can turn the atmosphere off. Oh, oh, there we go. Let me get rid of this. I can turn the atmosphere off, and now all of a sudden, you know, I can sort of zoom in on the sun here a little bit, and I can talk about, you know, where am I seeing then the sun in the sky, and, you know, what constellation is it in, or what stars um, are behind the sun, or what stars are not visible during the day, and what stars then, oh, oh, wrong button, what stars aren't visible during the day, and what stars are visible at night, and it depends then on the time of the year. Um, yeah, it's and if you if you sort of follow the constellations, one of the constellations I look for then is like Orion, and you associate then um, Orion with a uh, it's sort of a, a winter constellation because you you, tend, you see Orion then in the winter, and I always get all depressed then that first day in fall when I go outside and I see Orion, it's like oh winter's coming oh 
Um, but there you go. So certain stars, certain constellations you see at different times of the year. But this just makes sense as we go around the sun then, um, the view of the stars then that we see um, basically changes. And so this is, a, this is a slide then just sort of showing then. Here we are in January. If you look towards the sun, you might see it near or you'll see it near the constellation Sagittarius. As we move around in our orbit then, say by March, you go and you look to the sun and now you see then the sun then um, in the constell constellation of, the, of Aquarius then. And so thinking about the celestial sphere and the what we're seeing here though really is a reflection of the Earth's orbit then. As we're going around like this around the sun then, um, the view of the sun is changing because we're moving and we're seeing then a reflection of the Earth's orbit then on the celestial sphere. And so that's another way to think about the, the, the ecliptic then, just a projection then of the Earth's orbit on the celestial sphere. And you'll also though notice that the constellations it passes through the, the celestial on the celestial sphere that the ecliptic or the sun passes through then um, those are those are sort of uh, gosh I've heard of these before Leo and Virgo and Libra Scorpius Sagittarius Capricorn it turns out the path of the sun the ecliptic then actually passes through thirteen different constellations um, on its on you know, the sun on its trip across the earth through the celestial sphere and twelve of those constellations then are referred to then as the zodiacal constellations. And those are constellations then that the sun passes through over the course of the year. There is a 13th constellation that it just sort of clips, um, which is uh, the constellation Ophiuchus, but it's a lot easier if there are 12 constellations than um, then 13 because you can take you know 12 months and 30 days in each month and you get pretty close to a uh, close to a, a year that way that and it only sort of clips Ophiuchus and it's not like it goes right through Ophiuchus and um, like it does with something like Scorpius um, so if 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 you well, okay, what am I going to, I'm just going to come right inside. We all know sort of, you know, our, our zodiacal sign, our sort of birth sign like that. I, I'm a Taurus. And what that means then was that the sun was in the constellation Taurus um, on the day I was born. And it turns out maybe, maybe kind of not really quite, maybe, because um, don't forget, we've got this, this sort of wobble in our, uh, in our, in our axis and that wobble in our axis then changes, you know, the, the ecliptic is the reflection then of our orbit around the sun on the celestial sphere, and the celestial sphere is a reflection of our rotation. So as the Earth wobbles, the celestial sphere then, the, the, the celestial equator and the celestial pole then, they also change with time. And that point where the sun intersects the, uh, the celestial equator then changes with time. And where the sun uh, how do we want to say this? Where the, what constellation the sun is appearing in changes with time as well. And so when somebody says, oh, you're a Taurus, um, they're talking about where the sun was on your birthday um, back when almost 2,000 years ago then when the astrological signs were first set up. And there's a lab that we're... Uh, two labs from now, I think. Um, we're going to have you look at some sky charts then, and you can look at where the sun actually was when you were born, and compare it then um, to your birth sign, which is where the sun was when you were born on that date 2,000 years ago. And just the wobble in the Earth's axis has shifted that just a little bit. Um, and for some of you then, you're going to find out then that your uh, uh, sort of astrological sign um, isn't what you think it is. So anyways, um, Enough about that then. But this, this sort of idea then that the sun, you know, is, is appearing to move on the sky then. It moves through these 12 zodiacal constellations. And the view then of the stars that we also see um, also changes um, with time. So if you go out at midnight every night, you'll notice then that the stars you've seen over the course of months then at midnight then are going to be different. Because here on January 1st, then at midnight, you're looking towards Gemini. You know, you're basically midnight, you're looking, you're, the sun's on the opposite side of the earth from you. And you look up in the sky, you're going to see Gemini. Then a few months later here in March at midnight, you look away from the sun and you're going to see Leo then in that direction because we've shifted um, in our orbit. All right. So hopefully then that makes sense. Um, but um, there's, gosh, I guess we should talk about that then. Um, 
you know, how do we how do we keep track of time with all of this days and months and years and stuff like that? I mean, so the whole idea of day, I mean, what a day, what's a day? And you go, oh, well, a day's 24 hours. But how, how do you define a day? And sort of one way to define a day is how long does it take the sun to get back to the basically the same spot in the sky, or maybe looking towards the south, towards my meridian, it rises in the east, gets as high as it can be in the, on the meridian then, at, at, I'm just going to call that my local noon, and then goes back down to the west, it sets, travels around behind me, then pops back up, does the same thing again. So how long does it take to the sun to get back to my meridian? Or this idea of talking about a solar day then as one meridian to one meridian. And here you are looking towards the south on August 30th then. This is your meridian, that line from the south through your zenith then, right back to the north pole or to, to north. Uh, so from south to north, splitting the sky in half then. And, you know, the sun rises passes through your meridian sets, day later rises, passes through your meridian sets. How long does it take then to go from meridian to meridian? And, and okay, so there we go. I'm just going to say then, I'm going to define then that as, uh, as one solar day. Woohoo! Um, the question then though is, okay, that, that whole rising in the east, setting in the west, and that's the Earth's rotation on its axis. And have I seen one 360 degree rotation of the Earth over the course of a day? And yeah, you know the answer is not going to be, well, yes, that's one rotation of the Earth, because things are never uh, simple. What goes on, though, what happens, though, is over the course of that day, while we're rotating, don't forget we're also revolving around the sun. And so this idea, okay, we've got the sun, here's the Earth, we're going around the, we're going around the sun, and maybe, okay, so here we go. I'm going to say, all right, this is me, this is my meridian then, and here we go. The sun is on my meridian. I'm not on the equator, it's not directly above my head. This is the view just looking down like this. Um, and I'm going to say, though, here's the sun at its highest point in my sky, my meridian, um, directly above my head, and, and the zena everybody's lined up here then, and I'm, so I'm going to call this local noon. And this is, this is super exaggerated here, okay, but just super exaggerated. So the Earth rotates then as, as you know, it spins on its axis then, but it's also moving as it goes around the Earth. So like a couple hours later then, I've rotated from being, you know, from this, uh, how to say it then, I've rotated from here to here, and the Earth then is just rotating on its axis. You can see sort of me here on the axis, as the Earth, or on the Earth then, as the, the rotation carries me around the Earth. And, okay, I started then right here, pointing in this direction, then my meridian was pointing in this direction. Now I'm back. I'm pointing in the same direction. My meridian's pointing in the same direction. From here to here, I've undergone 360 degrees of rotation. I'm pointing back in the same direction. So, you know, the Earth, it's gone once around like that. But, because I've changed my position in orbit, I'm not lined up with the sun anymore because I've moved then, I've gone through one day, um, and we've got 360 uh, uh, degrees in a, in a circle like this, and 365 days in a year, so I've gone uh, one day or one 365 fifth of, of uh, my trip around the sun then, um, which is one trip is 360 degrees. So basically I move about a degree a day in the orbit um, as, as I sit there and rotate over the course of a day. And so this is not one degree, this is super enlarged here, but I'm just trying to show you then this misalignment. The sun then is not back on my meridian. And I have to wait a little bit until I rotate back along this extra distance to line back up with the sun like that. And so, um, I go through one complete rotation. I'm not quite pointed back with the sun, though, because my position has moved with respect to the sun. And I have to wait a little bit while longer then, go through about one more degree of rotation then, in order to line back up with the sun. So one rotation of the Earth, 360 degrees, to line back up with the sun, 360 degrees, plus that extra degree to line back up with the sun. And so, okay. I've defined my solar day, 24 hours, to be how long does it take me to line back up with the, uh, of the, with the sun? Um, well, how long does it take me to do one rotation? So maybe have that um, in the back of your head. But we can actually, we can actually sort of calculate this then. Um, this idea of, okay, uh, 
I should, I should define something here. We've got a term in astronomy then that's referred to as sidereal. So sidereal, we can't talk about it then, is sidereal. Whenever you see the word sidereal, it means with respect to the stars. And so we can talk about one sidereal rotation of the Earth, one 360 degree rotation of the Earth relative to some distant star that we're not really moving relative to. Or, you know, one true 360 degree rotation of the Earth, one sidereal day. And one rotation then, uh, not with respect to the Sun, but with respect to something that we're not moving uh, relative to. And so it's a real... Um, day, a real rotation of the Earth on its axis, a real 360 degree rotation, a sidereal day. But we've got this extra rotation then it takes to line back up with the day. And so here's sort of the hand drawing of what I tried to show you. Here you are on March 21st, you're lined up with the Sun. On March 22nd, when you're pointing back in the same direction, so you've gone here, you've gone through one rotation, you're pointing back in the same direction, you're not looking at, the, you haven't lined back up with the sun yet. And looking at this, and we're rotating counterclockwise, and we're moving counterclockwise. Oddly enough, pretty much everything in the solar system um, goes counterclockwise, which is a weird thing. I'll talk about that later. Um, okay, so, um, but I've got this little bit of extra rotation I need to do then to line back up with the, line back up with the sun. And so, um, if I go, you know, 360 degrees all the way around once, 365 days all the way around once, then I've gone one out of 365 days, or basically, oh, 360, 365. I basically then traveled one degree in my orbit then over the course of a day. And so I have to rotate then through an extra degree then to line back up with the sun. And so there's this extra little bit of time that I need to line back up with the sun. Um, well, how long does that take? And so you go, okay, one rotation, 360 degrees. One rotation takes 24 hours or 1,440 minutes. So um, one rotation takes 1,440 minutes. And well, 1,440 minutes, that's the same as 60 degrees. And so 1,440 minutes divided by 60 degrees then gets me, if I look at the units then, I've got minutes per degree. I divide the 1440 by 360. Basically, I move four minutes per degree of rotation. So for every degree the Earth is rotating on its axis, then everything is moved then by four degrees. And so, um, well, wait a minute then. So I've got to rotate then this extra degree uh, on, my, on my axis then. Uh, one degree then takes four minutes. And so to line back up with the sun, it takes the Earth an extra four minutes then um, to line back up with the sun, or to go from meridian to meridian then, um, that takes an extra four minutes. But I've defined the solar day to be 24 hours, so to line back up with the sun is 24 hours. That means to line up with the stars, or to do the, the 360 degree rotation then, sort of starting here, going around once, and lining back up with the stars, a sidereal day, that only takes 23 hours, 56 minutes. And then there's that extra four minutes to line back up with the sun, and that's what I'm going to call a day. And so the actual rotation of the Earth then is 23 hours, 56 minutes. That's our sidereal day, our true how long it takes us to spin on our axis. We have to add the extra four minutes, though, because when we've spun around once, we've moved in our orbit, we need that four minutes then to line back up with the sun. And, you know, I want the sun to be at its highest point in the sky at noon every day. Otherwise, things get crazy. I mean, uh, imagine... Um, imagine if the day was 25 hours long, and so every every day then the sun moved its position from the meridian then by one hour, it'd, be, it'd get weird fast. You want the sun at the same place in the sky relatively um, every day. All right, so what does that mean, though, for the stars? So, okay, so it takes 24 hours for the sun to get to about back to the same spot in the sky. What about the stars? Well, that only takes 23 hours, 56 minutes for a star to get back to the same spot in the sky. And so how does that work then? So think about then a star and thinking about going outside then and watching Betelgeuse rise. And you want to go out and you want to watch Betelgeuse rise. And um, to do that then, do you go out uh, at the same time every night of the year? And don't get tricky on me. I'm ignoring daylight saving time. Um, do you want to go out at the same time every night? Or do you want to go out four minutes earlier every night to see Betelgeuse rise? Do you want to go out four minutes later every night to see Betelgeuse rise? Um, 
or I, I'll tell you right off the bat, I don't know what D's about. I, I wrote that and it seemed to make sense when I wrote it now. That length, I got nothing with D. So basically it's between A, B, and C then. Well, if you think about it then, it takes 23 hours, 56 minutes for Betelgeuse to get back to the same spot in our sky. And 23 hours, 56 minutes is less than 24 hours, which means... Oh, oh, dang it! Which means Betelgeuse then actually rises four minutes earlier every every night, or or the star, or yeah. So yes, there we go. So so that's what's going on though. Um, this difference then between the apparent the solar day then relative to the sun and the sidereal day, and the sol sidereal day is shorter again because as we're going around the sun, we're rotating counterclockwise. We're also moving counterclockwise as seen from above, as seen from the north. And therefore, um, stars rise earlier each night and uh, set earlier um, each morning. All right. Okay. So another thing to talk about then is um, the calendar. And how do we want to set our, our seasons and our calendar? And um, one way to think about it then is we've got what's called the tropical year, which is the time it takes to the Earth to complete um, one 360-degree orbit around the sun. And that turns out then that's 365.24 um, two, two days. And, um, well, gosh, okay, you've got a problem here, though, because if you've got a calendar that's actually um, 365 days per year, um, you're, you're going to be off. You've got that 0.224, call it 0.25. You've got a quarter of a day that you're off every year and so what that means then is for the, for, ooh, there, I'm getting ahead, getting ahead of myself then, for the seasons then, they'd slowly be shifting because, because you're, you're off then by a quarter of a day each year with your calendar and think about then the start of spring um, on March 21st. Well, wait a minute then, you're, you're off a day. The, so four years later then, spring will start on March 20th. Four years later then, spring will start on March 19th. You're losing then every four days, you're losing a day on when the seasons are going to be happening on your calendar. And the next thing you know, like you know, about 700 years later, you're going to be like celebrating the first day of, of summer then on December 21st. And the, it's going to be, you're going to have summer in the winter and ah, it's going to be all messed up. And so this is what Julius Caesar um, sort of tried to solve with what was called the Julian calendar. And what he did was he added a leap year. So every fourth year then, or the year has 366 days. And so you think about it, you've got three at 365 and then a fourth at 366. You take the average of that then, you've got a, a, an average calendar year then of 365.25 days, which is really, really, really close to 365.2422 days. Um, and this was in use then um, uh, for, for over 15 centuries then. It only slipped um, 11 minutes, 14 seconds um, per year, which is actually pretty good. But that's 11 minutes, 14 seconds every year. That does add up. And it, it was so bad then that in sort of, you know, the by about the late 1500s or so, um, the calendar had slipped by about 10 days. And this was actually important. Uh, a lot of this was driven by the date of Easter, which is uh, a very important date um, for, for some religions then, and it's prescribed what date it has to occur, and, and it was slipping on them then. It was getting basically slipping towards, Easter was slipping towards the winter. And it was in 1582 then, um, they were off by about 10 days. And that's when Pope Gregory III introduced a new calendar then, um, the Gregorian calendar then. And so, um, oh, why, uh, that's, sorry. Right. So, um, in 1582, then, he basically had to clean up the 10 days. So in 1582, you went to bed on October 4th, you woke up on October 15th then. And that basically realigned the calendar, um, got Easter happening back when it should be happening then, and cleared up that 15-day error then that had been caused by the, uh, by the Julian calendar then. And he also then, to fix it then, you had this idea of leap years, but now um, we also had... Um, how do we want to say it? Um, the century years are leap years, except when the, the, the year is, um, what do we want to say? Oh, okay. So, um, except if the year is divisible um, by 100. And so, um, 
let's see. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I always get this wrong. Um, okay, so every four years, if the, if the year is divisible by four, it's a leap year. Um, and that, that works then, except every 400 years, if the year was divisible by 400, then it wasn't a leap year. And so that, that little bit then, by dropping that leap year, um, every once every 400 years then, it moved the calendar then to um, 365.2425 days, which is really close to 365.2422 days. And so our error then now is only about one day every 3,300 years. Um, and what what got people about this though was in the year 2000 um not only was it the well, was it the uh you know the the the, the millennium and the, the y2k bug and stuff like that then um 2000 was a leap year and so um if you knew the rules just barely enough that you knew if it was divisible by 400 it wasn't a leap year um Wait, if it was, oh, how to say this? If you didn't know this rule, then um, with the the divisibility by four hundred, then um, uh, you would have had two thousand in as a leap year. And I just remember there was some software um, that that didn't actually account for that that uh, that had to be fixed at the time. Anyways. Um, that's the calendar then we use today then, this Gregorian calendar then, where if the year is divisible by four, it's a leap year, unless it's divisible by 400, and then it's not a leap year. And this is the calendar then we use today. The only sort of twitch then was this was introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory. Um, if you think about England and the colonies, they weren't Catholic, didn't really get along with the Pope that well. And so England and the colonies did not adopt the Gregorian calendar um, right away at all. It actually took them a couple hundred years to get to it then. And here's the the, the calendar then for the colonies for the for you know us and and England then in 1752. And by that point then they'd slipped uh, not 10 days but they'd been off by 11 days um, in the calendar. And this looks fine unless you look at September where um, in 1752 on September 2nd you went to bed and then you woke up then on September um, 13th. Um, and so, yeah, they, uh, the, that's when they did the adjustment to put the calendar then back on the uh, back get it back aligned then and to get it lined up with the colony or get it lined up with the con continent then. Um, and yes, so back, so this was the, oh, how much do you want to know about this? This is the Calendar Act of 1750. And before this then, um, in England, um, the start of the, the new year, the new legal year actually began on the 25th of March. And so as part of this then, they also switched the, the, the legal uh, start of the new year to January 1st. And then they went through this tremendous effort then to realign the calendar with what was going on with the continent and most of the rest of the world then, and to switch to a Gregorian system um, where you didn't have this, uh, you know, didn't lose track of the days uh, like this so much. So much. Um, so, and yes, they actually had things. Uh, it was written into the law though, um, where like your rent um, was actually prorated and things like that. So you didn't get burned in September then um, for having to pay your full rent then for a month uh, that that was eleven days short. Anyways, all right. It's, calendar stuff, um, just absolutely fascinating. But this brings to an end then, um, um, uh, this part of chapter, uh, chapter three. And so, um, I'm going to sort of pause here for a second and get the, uh, get the next stuff set up. And if you want to, um, you know, just take a break and hit the pause button and like me, get some coffee, um, feel free. All right, so um, the second part of chapter three then. So the first part of chapter three, we were sort of looking at the, the celestial sphere and the motions of the sun. And now we're finally gonna talk about a new object then and, uh, and the moon and the motions of the moon. Yay, something new. Okay, so um, the moon is different from the sun. Who said astronomy is hard? Um, and, and you can tell just by looking at it. And, and one sort of interesting question is, why does the moon look different um, 
at different times. And so, you know, you can look at times when the moon's full, and here we've got sort of a crescent moon going on here, and, and why does the moon change its appearance? And, and it's a sort of... Um, simple, surprisingly simple answer to that is because the moon doesn't emit its own light. The moon then um, basically just reflects light. It, it's not a source of its own own light like the sun is then. And depending on how the light is shining on the moon, we'll see it lit up differently. And we talk about then this, this change in appearance and really as the phases of the moon. So the moon doesn't emit its own light then. You're basically just seeing reflected sunlight, and I'll give it away, you're seeing reflected sunlight then um, from the sun. And this is a surprisingly, I don't know, um, maybe, maybe I'll just so, so when I go out and talk to people then, and, and we get on the subject then of the phases of the moons, the moon, there are a lot of different theories out there why the moon then has these, uh, has these different phases. And in talking to people then, um, some, some people think it's the Earth's shadow then that's falling on different parts of the moon, making it appear to have different um, phases. I've even met people who think maybe the moon isn't entirely spherical, it's maybe somewhat flattened, and depending on how we look at it then, it'll appear sort of differently. And some little kids I've met then have thought that maybe, um, and, and uh, maybe it's even some adults, uh, thinking then that it, maybe it's the Earth's clouds then um, covering uh, part of the moon at various times and causing these changes in the phase. Or um, even the sunlight then reflecting off the earth and lighting up the, the moon differently and depending on how it's aligned then maybe we'll get different reflections then of the, the, the reflected sunlight from the earth then on the moon and of course then uh, maybe we're only seeing it then depending on how it's lit up um, as it's going around the earth how we see it then from the earth being lit up by the sun and, and of course hopefully um, I doubt you've had much of a chance then to, uh, to read ahead but the real answer then for what's going on here then um, is, is E. Although the shadow thing is a very, 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 very common misconception that it's your shadow then falling on the moon at different times. So what's up with the phases of the moon? Why do we see the moon um, lit up differently as it's going around the earth? And usually when you see the picture like this, for some people sort of a light bulb goes off in their head, oh, okay, maybe that sort of makes sense. And so we can think about what we're seeing. We've got the sun here. It's off to the right. We've got sunlight then flying in um, from the right to the left then. And this is the view from above then. We're looking down on the earth and we've got the earth sort of rotating here. We're looking down on the earth from the North Pole. And we've got the moon then going around um, the, the earth then and thinking about then how the moon is going to be lit up by the sun. And maybe like right here, if you think about what's going on right here, we've got, right, so we've got, we've got here's the earth and the sun is off in this direction. So we've got the light then moving from the right to the left then. And I've got the moon right here. And if I think about what part of the moon is going to be lit up by the sunlight then, it's going to be the side of the moon facing the sun. And so this back side of the moon here then that's facing away from the sun, that's going to be entirely in shadow. And think about though, if you're sitting here on the earth, there we go, and you look up at the moon, what are you going to see? You're basically going to see then um, the moon, in, you're going to see the moon in shadow. The, the, there's no part of the moon that's being lit up then um, that's pointing towards you. And you can think about then, well, okay, what about when the moon is right here? So it's moved a quarter of its orbit then around the Earth. And think about what part of the moon is being lit up by the sun. And again, it's just the side of the moon that's facing the sun that's being lit up. So the sun then is again off in this direction. The light's coming from the, the right to the left then. And um, there we go. So, so the sort of this side of the moon is in shadow, and now you look at the moon, there you are, you look up at the moon, and you're going to see a moon then that sort of looks like this. One half of it's going to be dark, the other half of it's going to be light. And we'll, also, we'll, we'll give that a name then of actually first quarter. And I should talk about then what you see here then. Here you'll see a moon then that's completely black as you look at it or you won't really see the moon at all. Um, and this we might refer to then as a new moon. 
and we think about then, okay, another quarter of the orbit later then, here's the moon, and now the sunlit side of the moon um, is on the right, and the shadow side of the moon then is always on the left, because the sun's on the right, and here I am on the earth, I'm looking up at that moon, and what do I see? Oh, the moon's totally lit up then, so I see a totally lit up full moon, and then the moon goes through another quarter of its orbit here, so something like this. And again, the side of the moon facing the sun is lit up. The side of the moon facing away from the sun is dark. And now here I am on the Earth, and I look up, and I see the moon sort of look at like this. And I see, there we go, technically I see it sort of upside down. And so I'm just going to draw it like this because I see it sort of upside down. I, I drew it like this then because the side that's lit is actually uh, uh, flipped. Um, and this then would be the third quarter. And then it goes around then, and boom, uh, goes and another quarter of its uh, orbit later then, it's back in the full moon. And so looking at the, at the figure here then, um, that's sort of what they're trying to show then. With the, the new moon here, you're looking towards the moon, but the, the part of the moon then that you see is the part that's facing away from the sun. That side's all dark, and so you just see um, basically your new moon. And then a quarter of the, the moon's trip around later then. You've got the first quarter here then. You look up at the moon. You see half of it lit up. You see half of it dark. And so starting here with the new moon, you see then more and more of the moon lit up, this sort of crescent moon. And notice it's the left-hand side of the moon in this picture. And right about here then is first quarter. So you see about you know half the moon lit up in the first quarter. As it continues around then, uh, technically this is referred to as waxing crescent. As, as you're seeing this crescent moon and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, it's waxing until you get to the first quarter here. And if it's more than a quarter full, we talk about it as a gibbous moon. And so the moon is continuing uh, around like this until it's on its way to, to being a full moon. And you're seeing more and more of the moon lit up until you get then to the full moon. And so here, looking on the Earth, you see about half the moon lit up. Here, looking on the Earth, you look up, you see more than half of the moon lit up. By the time it gets over here to the full moon then, it's opposite the sun. You look up and you see the moon fully lit up and you say, oh look, this is a, this is a full moon. And as it continues around then, you see less and less of the moon lit up. And by, by the time it gets to the third quarter then, the side of the moon isn't pointed, you know, the lit up side of the moon isn't pointing towards you anymore. It's pointing off in this direction. You look up, you see half of the moon dark, half of the moon light, that's the third quarter. And so starting with the full moon, you see basically more and more shadow appearing as it works its way around. Here it is then at, uh, at first quarter, or sorry, at third quarter. And notice first quarter then, we've got one side lit up, the other side dark. It's flipped on third quarter. And that's just because our, our view has changed. Um, and we talk about it then as waxing, getting less and less lit up, but it's still more than halfway lit up, so it's gibbous. So here it's doing the waxing gibbous thing. And again, it's getting less and less lit up as it works its way around from third quarter back to new, and sort of like halfway between third quarter and new. When you look at it from the Earth, then you see mostly uh, mostly shadow, maybe a little bit of the light here. And you talk about that then as, as a, uh, a waxing, sorry, a waning um, crescent. So we've got, I probably said waxing before, we've got waning gibbous here and waning crescent um, there. But that's the basic idea. And you think about how long this takes to go around once, await full moon to full moon or new moon to new moon. That's sort of the definition of a month, maybe about 30 days or so. It goes 360 degrees in 30 days. And so uh, 360 divided by 30, then it moves about 13 degrees um, in orbit around us or 13 degrees on the celestial sphere then um, every day. And so that's sort of what's going on then um, with the phases of the moon. And it's really then just how we see the moon lit up as it's going around us um, here on the Earth. And so yes, it's about 13 degrees each day, and we see different portions of the moon's surface lit up by the sun, and that's what's causing then um, the different phases uh, of the moon. All right, so yes, here we go. This is all sort of the same thing. Um, the lunar phase we see on a particular day depends on um, how we're lined up between the Earth, the sun, and the moon. All right.
So maybe here's a, another look at it, though, because if you think about when you're going to see the moon in what phase, what time of day you're going to see the moon in what phase, those are also related because this is, a, this is an alignment then between the moon, the earth, and the sun. And wait a minute, though, where the sun is appearing in our sky then, is it noon, is it midnight? Um, that's also sort of in play here then. I mean, one way to think about it then is if the, the moon is here uh, in near the sun then in our sky. It's sort of in the same direction as the sun in our sky, which is why we only see the shadow, you know, the moon in shadow. We don't even really notice it in our sky. Um, when are you going to see that moon? And you go, well, wait a minute then. The moon is off in the same direction as the sun. Um, well, if it's in the same direction as the sun, the moon's going to be up while the sun is up. And so that the new moon is actually in our sky during the day. And, um, and, and think about then the full moon. In order for the moon to be full, it needs to be on the opposite side of the earth then from the sun. And well, wait a minute then. If the, the moon is on the opposite side of the sun, I'm going to see that moon at night. And the moon's going to be then at the highest point in, its, in the sky for me then. When the sun is on the opposite side of the earth from me, the moon's going to be at the highest point in the sky in this, uh, at, at midnight then. Because it's on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. So I'll see the full moon then at its highest point um, on midnight. That's sort of what this, this slide's sort of sh trying to show then. Or this idea for this picture, and I almost kind of want you to do this, maybe with nobody looking though, but this idea, I'm going to go out, I'm going to look towards the south, and if I look towards the south then, I've got west to my right, and I've got east to my left. And I've got sort of the rotation of the celestial sphere. Basically, things are rising to my left, to the east, they're getting high in the sky, then directly in front of me to the south. And then as the rotation continues, then they're getting lower and lower then um, and setting then in the west. And so think about then where the moon is going to be appearing then um, when it's new. And you say, all right, well, the moon and the sun are basically off in the same direction then. And basically, I'll, if it's near new then, I'll sort of see the moon. Well, I probably won't even see it then. But I'll see the moon. It's around the sun um, at sunset. But as the, the orbit of the moon then carries it around the Earth then, well, when it's at that first quarter then, and I can sort of go back to this picture, when it's at the first quarter, this is the direction towards the sun, and the, the moon then is 90 degrees away from the sun. And so thinking about then first quarter then, I've got the sun here, it's just at sunset then, I'm looking towards the south, there's the sun at sunset, I know the moon is 90 degrees away from the sun, and if the sun is just setting there in the west at sunset, 90 degrees from that, it's going to be right, basically looking right towards the south then, I'm going to see the moon at its highest point in the sky then at sunset in the evening then, if it's in the first quarter, because the moon will, or the sun will just be setting in the west right there, 90 degrees away is the moon, boom, there it is, right south, right on my meridian, and when it's on my meridian, when it's due south, for me in the north here, that's when it's going to be at its highest point in the sky. And think about then, um, you know, a quarter of the moon's orbit later, or about a week later then, the moon is 180 degrees away from the sun. Sort of going back to this picture then, here's the sun, here's the moon, opposite side of the sky, 180 degrees apart. So I go out at sunset then, I've got the moon set, I've got the sun setting in the west here. The moon is 180 degrees away from the sun. I'm just going to see the moon rising if it's full, 180 degrees away from the sun. I'm just going to see that moon then rising at sunset. And when the moon is, or when the sun is completely, you know, its furthest point behind me, then um, uh, the moon's going to be at its highest point when it's full. Then I'm going to see it at its highest point then at midnight um, in my sky. And so thinking about then the phases of the moon, that's sort of what they're trying to show here, where when the moon is new, it's in the same direction at the sun as the sun, and you almost can't even really see it then um, at sunset. A one week later then, or a quarter of its orbit around the Earth later then, it's at the first quarter, 90 degrees away from the sun. So we've got the sun setting here in the west, 90 degrees away. There's the moon in the south, and so you'll see it then right at sunset, um, and its highest point in the south when it's at the first quarter. And then when the moon is full, there it is rising then in the east, just as the sun's setting, because they're 180 degrees apart. Um, 
taking it further than that. We're going to sort of flip things around. I'm still looking south. I've still got east to my left and west to my right, but now I'm going out in the morning uh, at dawn then um, to see what's going on with the moon. And again, if, if the moon is new, um, I'm going to see it then in the same direction. So let me just, let me back up and start then. I should start with the full moon. All right, so we'll start at the full moon. I'm going out. It's sunrise then, south, east, west. Here's the sun just rising in the east here. And I look 180 degrees away then. There's the moon. The sun is rising in the east. The full moon then is just setting in the west. And so, yeah, it, it, it rises at, at sunset and it sets at sunrise if the moon is full because it's 180 degrees away from the sun. One week later, or a quarter of the revolution around the Earth later then, the moon um, has, has moved by 90 degrees, and so it's just 90 degrees then between the sun and the moon, except here's the moon here, here's my 90 degrees, or 270 degrees if you want to think about it this way, but I prefer to just think about them as 90 degrees away. But now then, the, the moon is to the west of, uh, to the, west of the sun. Um, or here's the sun rising then in the east, at, at dawn, and the moon then 90 degrees away from the sun, and it's just at third quarter then, there it is at its highest point in the sky then at sunrise. And as the, as the week goes on, the moon continues to move in its orbit, and if I go out every sunrise then, I'll see the moon then um, closer and closer to the sun in the east as it's starting to rise until I get back to the same alignment then, the same new moon with the moon in the same direction as the sun, rising with the sun then um, in the morning. All right. So hopefully that makes some sort of sense. This this is one of the harder things uh, when I first took this course to sort of get my head around, though, this idea of trying to figure out then uh, where the moon is appearing then um, at different times of the day, uh, depending on where it is in its orbit then um, around the Earth. But there's sort of the, the basic idea. Um, all right. So, gosh. Yeah, I... All right, I'm just going to go through, uh, we actually sort of already have this um, drawn out here then. And you, but you can think about then, um, let me just sort of go back and start from scratch here then. You can think about going back to a drawing like this and thinking about then where you're going to see then um, the moon, depending on where it is, at midnight or at noon or at 6 a.m., or at midnight. And so um, let's maybe just pick 6 a.m. here. So here's the Earth then. Oop. Here's the Earth. And again, we're rotating counterclockwise. Here's the North Pole. And so, okay, so 6 a.m. So here's the sun, the direction of the sun. I'll put it off to the, to the right then. And the sun then, it's just rising. So 6 a.m., it's just rising. So I am going to be here on the Earth. Maybe I shouldn't have started with the hard one, though. But here's sort of my horizon. And here's my zenith. And if I'm thinking about this is my horizon, oh, I shouldn't have started with the upside down one. Um, but as, as time goes on, then, as the rotation goes on, this is my horizon. I can't see anything below my horizon. No. I'm going to, never mind. I'm going to back up, and I'm going to start with the easy one, then. I'm going to start with sunset. And so here's the Earth, then. Here I am on the Earth. Here's the direction towards the sun. Off to the right here then. And here's sort of my horizon then. I really can't see anything below this um, because the Earth is in the way. And we're rotating like this. And so what's going to happen is a couple minutes later then, this is going to be my horizon as I rotate around like this. And now the sun then is below the horizon. So it has just set. And I can think about then where I'm going to see the moon at sunset then, um, or sorry, it's, yeah, at sunset, let me just put this on here, at sunset then, um, what phase it's going to be in and where it's going to be in my sky. And so here at sunset then, here's the moon and the side of the moon then, uh, point, uh, facing me then is not lit up at all. And so that's a new moon and I'm going to see the moon then on the horizon at sunset with the sun. And so this would be towards the west and I've got the moon then setting with the sun. If the moon is in first quarter then, it'll be up here then. I'll see half of the moon lit up at first quarter and the moon then will be at its highest point in the sky then. I'll see the moon at its highest point in the sky to the south at sunset then if it's in its first quarter. If it's a full moon, then it's over here. 
and I see the moon then, well, I'm going to put it a little bit above the horizon so as to not confuse you. I'll see the moon then over here. Here I am looking at, oh, look, it's a full moon then. And um, this is west, this is east, and oh, it's it's basically setting in the, the west. Things are setting in the west, they're rising in the east. I come back a little while later after we've been through a rotation, and yeah, now I'm here then, and the moon is, has risen above my horizon. So yeah, I've got the full moon then rising at sunset then in the east. Or um, I can think about then sort of the, uh, what it'll look like, what else, oh wait, what about the third quarter? So at the third quarter then, oh wait, I'm not going to see the moon at all because it's going to be below my horizon um, the entire time. And so I'm um, thinking about what you see at different times of the day, depending on where um, where the moon is then um, in its orbit around us. And let me just sort of show you some other ones then. I'll keep the moons here. Um, oh, I erase the Earth. Oh, um, there we go. I'll put the Earth back. Um, here I am at midnight. So something like that. Here I am at midnight then. Here's my horizon. I can't see anything below my horizon. The sun then is as far away as it can get from me then in the sky. It's on the opposite side of the Earth from me then. It's midnight and I look. And here is my western horizon. Here is my eastern horizon. I'm rotating around like this then. And it's midnight then. I'll never see the new moon. It's below my horizon then, completely below my horizon. If it's a first quarter moon, I'll just see it setting in the, in the west. If it's a third quarter moon then, I'll just see it rising then in the east. Because my rotation then is carrying my horizon like this. And this moon then, this third quarter moon then, is getting higher and higher in the east. And... There we go. I'll look up then, and the full moon then will be, so full, the full moon then will be at its highest point in my sky. I'll see it then due south then, um, if it's a full moon, and I'm out at midnight then. Or you can think about, um, what if instead, this will be easy, I'm out here on this side of the earth then, oh, uh, what time is it? Oh, wait, the sun's at its highest point in my sky then, this would correspond to noon, and if I look then at noon, um, the sun, if it's a new moon then, and, and uh, they're aligned with, it's aligned with the sun then, the moon's at its highest point in the sky then at noon. Um, yeah, so the new moon then is up in, at, at basically at noon then at, at its highest point in the south. Um, I'm on the other side here then, so east and west are reversed. So this is east, this is west. Um, nope, this is still west. And this is still east. So I'll look then, and I'll see then the uh, the uh, third quarter moon just setting at noon, or the the first quarter moon then just rising at, at noon then um, in the east. And you can go through this uh, as much as you you, you want. Then um, I'm not going to ask you a question like this on the exam. I just sort of decided there's enough going on right now without you having to make you quite draw these diagrams. I might ask you something about um, you know where the sun is and the moon um, at the new or the full or the first quarter phase, something like that. But it, it'll be pretty basic where you wouldn't won't necessarily have to make um, make a drawing like this. And but that's the basic idea though is you can basically look at the phase of the moon at certain times of the day and make a diagram like this then to figure out then where the moon is then um, at its different phases at, uh, at different times of the, uh, of the day. And so, um, oh yeah, okay, so um, we do a little Calvin and Hobbes sort of cartoon here and um, this, the trouble, What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this cartoon? I love Calvin and Hobbes to death. I know it's old. <coughs> but um, do you notice anything wrong with this cartoon? And what what caught my eye about it then was this this sort of um, oh, dang nabbit moon that they've got here then. Um, and it's it's obviously a crescent moon here. It's maybe waxing or waning. I think it's probably a, a a waxing crescent moon, something like that. And the trouble, though, is if you think about um, the waxing or waning, the crescents, then they're always pointed then towards the sun because the lit up side that you're seeing then, um, it's being lit up by the sun. So the lit up side of the moon then, it's always pointing towards the sun. And so if this is the lit up side of the moon here, what direction is the sun? 
And so that, well, okay, this is the side being lit up. The sun then has to be off in the upper right in this picture um, in order for the moon to be lit up that way. And again, you can sort of see it here with the, you know, the sun is off in the lower right here. The sun is just setting right here and it's, it's shining on the moon, making it light up like that. But wait a minute. So this means the sun is in the upper right in this picture in order to, to light up the moon like this. Can that actually be happening? Ah, uh, no, that's actually, it would be daylight um, in order to have the moon looking like this. And so here, um, there, I fixed it for you. Um, and that's the trouble with astronomy nerds is we see things like that and people aren't careful with their moon phases. Um, and so anyways, so, uh, all right. So um, another thing to talk about then, this is Pink Floyd's 1973 album, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, and, and people talk about the dark side of the moon and it's... It, what they're really talking about is this idea that we only really only see maybe sort of about one side of the moon. We only always have the same face of the moon then sort of pointing towards us. So we always see the same side of the moon. There's a side of the moon that you don't see from Earth. And, and this idea then, the dark side of the moon then, um, is usually referring to this unseen side. But... Does that other side of the moon, does, is that always dark? Does that never see any light? Um, and what's going on with the moon? And the idea then that we always only see the same side of the moon is the moon is tidally locked to the earth. And uh, we'll talk more about this later uh, once we've developed the idea of gravity and stuff like that. But because of the gravitational tides then, the, the gravitational pull of the earth on the moon, it's caused the moon then um, basically to always have the same side facing the earth. And this happens then because the moon's rotation period is the same as its orbital period. So it goes around on its axis once and the same amount of time then it takes to go around the earth once. And so as this happens then, it's always got the same side facing towards us. And again, this picture is not to scale, but if you had a little mountain on the earth then, um, that little, sorry, mountain on the moon then, that little mountain, as the moon went around then, is always pointing uh, towards the Earth. And you can sort of see it here. Uh, here's the little mountain, and it's going counterclockwise. And if you keep your eye on the little mountain then, it will have gone through one rotation by the time it gets back to the same point. And so that, that spot on the moon then is always um, pointing towards the Earth. And this is not a weird thing at all. Almost all of the moons in the solar system then are tidally locked um, to their planets. And we'll even see like Mercury is kind of weirdly um, tidally locked to the sun. So it's, it's not... Um, it's not an unusual thing in our solar system. But what it does mean, though, is we've got this other opposite side of the moon that we can't see. But the question then is, does that opposite side of the moon, is it really always dark? And, of course, the answer to that is no. So here we've got a situation. The sun is off here on the right. We've got a new moon for us. This side of the moon is facing towards us. The opposite side of the moon that we can't see is fully lit up. Yeah, sure. Uh, two weeks later, half a month later then, now the side of the moon that we see is facing towards us and facing towards the sun, and it's entirely lit up. And yes, that other side of the moon is completely dark. But even here, the side of the moon then at that third quarter that's facing away from us is half lit up by the sun. And by new moon, that entire backside of the moon then is being lit up by the sun. And so, no, there's no really such, there's no such thing as the dark side of the moon. There's a side of the moon we can't see from Earth, um, but it's not always, not always dark. Um, and so here's sort of a, a, a drawing then of the phases of the moon and their different names and sort of what they look like. And again, I'll probably, what am I saying? On the, on the exam, I'll concentrate on new first quarter, uh, full, and third quarter, and uh, don't worry so much about the waning and waxing gibbous and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, so one more thing about time then. Um, and looking at time and thinking about then, well, I've already sort of given it away then, how long does it take the moon to go around the Earth um, once? 
And so we can think about it then. Um, the moon moves about 13 degrees per day, and it goes around once 360 degrees then. Um, and so it turns out then that it takes about 27.32 days then for the moon to go around in its orbit once, relative to a fixed location in space, or relative then um, to the stars. And so what are we going to call that? Oh, we're going to call that then the sidereal period. And again, that, there's that word then, sidereal, that means relative to the stars or relative to a fixed point um, in space or what you might think of then as the real period of the moon around the Earth, 27.32 uh, th uh, days then. So, um, and that's, <coughs> that's our 360 degree rotation. But, okay... Is that how long it takes to go through one set of phases for the moon? To go from new moon to new moon, or full moon to full moon? Does it take 27.32 days? And you know the answer to that's going to be no, because this is astronomy and everything's moving. And it's a similar situation to what we saw with the sidereal period of the Earth versus a solar day, where it only takes us 23 hours, 56 minutes to go around on our axis once, but it takes... 24 hours <laughs> pardon me. 24 hours to go from full moon to full moon. And so the idea here then is sort of, you know, look up in the sky, here's the new moon. Um, the sun and the moon then are pretty much off in the same direction. And the moon then goes around the earth once. And here the moon is in Scorpius, it goes around the earth once. It's back in Scorpius again. It's back lined up then in the same direction um, relative to the stars, or relative to a fixed point, it's gone through 360 degrees of rotation, or sorry, 360 degrees of revolution. The trouble is, the Earth has moved in its orbit, and so the position of the Sun on the celestial sphere then has changed over that course of the month. Or so it's maybe gone through, well, we got 12 months in a year, so it's gone through uh, one twelfth of the uh, of the one twelfth of the distance then on on the celestial sphere, or um, the the moon then has moved. Sorry, slow, as you can tell, it's getting, I've been talking a long time. <laughs> um, over the course of the month, um, you know, thirty days. That just basically move, means the the sun then has moved about twelve degrees then um, on the ecliptic during the course of that month because it's got to go three hundred and sixty degrees um, in twelve months, and so it's gone one twelfth of its distance travel distance on the ecliptic then the sun's really changed its position a lot so yeah the moon gets back to the same spot in the sky it does one fixed or one rotation around the earth once revolution around the earth one sidereal period but now the sun has changed and to get to the next new moon the sun's got to line back up with the moon again that that alignment has to happen again so that moon then has to travel some extra distance then um, to catch back up with the sun. And so here's sort of the idea. Here's the, the sun here, and fine, it's a new moon, um, but there we go. There's one sidereal revolution. There's one sidereal period of the moon, but in that time, the position of the sun has changed because we've actually changed uh, where we are in our orbit, and so we've got this extra little time then for the moon to catch back up with the sun. And so to go from the period then to go from new moon to new moon or full moon to full moon then is actually a little bit longer. It's 29.53 days. And we talk about this then as the synodic period of the moon. And synodic then means means with respect to the sun. And so there's the sidereal period of the moon, how long it takes to go around once, that's the, the, the 27 days, and the, the synodic period then, how long it takes to go from new moon to new moon then, um, a complete cycle of phases then, that's 29.53 days. And that's actually sort of what we base our month on then, is the synodic period then, how long between full moon to full moon then, and sort of define that then um, as a month, sort of, there we go, sort of new moon to new moon. All right, so um, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll pick this up tomorrow, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll pick this up tomorrow, though, is this idea of eclipses. And you can go back to some of these drawings that we've been using, um, something like this then, and say, well, wait a minute then. Um, isn't the moon going to get in the way of the sun when it's over here in the same direction of the sun? And won't the moon then pass into the Earth's shadow here when it's on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun? 
And that does happen occasionally. We refer to the, those as eclipses. But you might want to think about, well, why don't they happen every you know, every month then. Why doesn't, why don't we have a lunar eclipse, the moon falling into the Earth's shadow? Why doesn't that happen every full moon? Or why every new moon when the moon and the sun are off in the same direction? Why don't we have a solar eclipse then every month with the new moons? And so that's what we'll start talking about then um, on, on Monday then. And don't forget then at the end of this chapter, um, we're going to have uh, our first test. And of course, more about that then as that, uh, that day draws closer. So again, if you have any questions, questions. I'm online from two, to, or sorry, from 12 to 2 today and from um, 3 to 5 today. Also then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be around then um, from uh, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, tonight then. Also, if you have any any lab questions, and I can even answer, answer questions about this uh, during that lab time too. So just zoom in, talk to me then uh, if you have any questions about any of this, even if, even if we haven't talked about something. Um, Go ahead and, and, and zoom in because, yeah. All right. Take care.